Okay, I'm Chris. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about my exploration of robots. Um, I'm gonna use my phone for notes, so I'm not checking Reddit on the side while I talk here. I'm just trying to, to uh, keep up with the notes. Um, so I'll just show you walls of text on the screen while I talk to you. Um, first of all, what's a robot? Um, anything that can physically interact with the analog world um, could be a kind of robot. Um, I define a robot, though, as something that can gather information um, about the world around it through sensors and then make decisions about that based on that information and then act on it without further human interaction. Um, that definition leaves it open to a door, though. Um, but if you think about an automatic door as a robot, it gives you some creative... Um, you can think about it creatively, because the door can do a lot more than just open when people walk up to it. If you just think about it... Um, more creatively. Anyway, um, robots are in your house, they vacuum. Um, this is actually the basis of the larger robot I have there. Um, the only thing that isn't really a robot is something that's purely remote controlled. However, you can't really con have a computer control it until you can control it yourself electronically. So really remote control is the first step. Um, often you have with a telepresence type robot. Um, so back to my presentation here. Um, I'm going to focus on um, larger robots that are able to navigate their environment autonomously. And um, I'm just going to talk about uh, the software I found to be able to do that with. Um, my goals, it's a hobby. I'm not a college. I'm not doing a doctoral thesis or anything. It's not a business research project. It's a hobby. Um, and really what I wanted to create was a mobile platform to uh, code, build, and experiment on. So. That's what I was going for. Um, some types of robots that are out there now. I just thought I'd show a few examples of what's out there. Um, back to my pictures here. Um, this is a robot that's going to be in or has been put in some stores in California in Home Depot and Lowe's. You're supposed to be able to walk up to the robot and um, show it what you've got. It just takes a picture of it, uses image recognition, and then theoretically could actually show you how to, you know, where the part is. So just, you know basic things all being put together to make a robot. Um, this is a robot from some hospitals in, a, in England where they take this robot, um, it just drives around the halls, um, it navigates its environment, but it doesn't deviate from its uh, path, it'll just stop if you get in its way. But what it does is it hauls these trays around uh, full of foods instead of having nurses, you know, college trained nurses pushing carts around the hallway, they have these robots that can push them down the hallway, it saves a lot of effort. Uh, Lego has robots that move around the machines that make the Legos. The robots take the bins, the empty and full bins, and deliver them. Again, they navigate a fixed path, but they are autonomous, and they'll uh, stop if you get in their way. Amazon, similar to the other two, they actually have these uh, shelves. The shelves sit on top of the robot, so the shelves run around. If you look up Amazon robots, you'll see these interesting videos of all these shelves running all over this warehouse because the robots just drive around the warehouse. and. Um, so instead of going to the shelf, they can bring the shelf to the picker, or they can rearrange the shelves. Um, and then this is something that was in the news uh, a few months ago. It's a dishwashing robot. What's special about the robot is it's able to um, analyze an object that it's never encountered before and determine the best way to grasp the object and handle it, which is a big deal because if you've got a pile of dishes, you don't want to have to program the robot to pick up every single dish. So those are the kind of things that are going on right now um, commercially with robots that, that are out there. Um, so why build a robot? Um, to my notes here. Um, a robot is like building a video game in reverse. So we build a simulated environment inside the computer based on the real world using sensor data and then attempt to navigate that environment. Our success is based both on how well we interact with the simulated environment and how well our simulated environment mirrors the real world. So, you know, things like glass, you know, what does the robot do with that? He sees right through it. So he simulated what he sees, but not what's really there, things like that. But a video game, you navigate a simulated environment. It's the same thing with the robot. He's navigating a simulated environment, really, um, but hopefully he's simulating the real environment around him. That's the, the challenges, um, there's how do you, how do you um, analyze the environment fully enough and simulate it fully. Um, 
And building robots is introspective. Uh, as humans, we do the same thing. We interact with the real world all day long. Our behavior and decisions are actually based on the simulation that we build in our brains of the world around us. Um, we don't really know what's going on around us inside our heads. We, we have to use our senses and, and make our best guess. Um, sometimes it doesn't work, right? That's why drunk driving is such a problem. Your simulation of the world around you is skewed. Um, and then, you know, simple things. Uh, it's a little hard to see here. I tried to overlay some two pictures, but the blue box here is the picture of the room uh, that was created by the robot at my house. So the blue line over here is the wall, but there's a mirror on that whole wall. So when the robot gets over there, he actually looks through the wall and creates this whole other room inside the wall. Um, so it's just an in the idea of, you know, what does a robot do when he sees a mirror? Um, you know, you and I have ways of dealing with this. Um, Interestingly, though, we don't actually um, recognize patterns that well. We sort of generate them. That's why we're always making up faces in tree bark. We make up faces, you know, in anything we see. We actually generate patterns all the time. And then, but we have a really good filter system to look at something and go, you know, that's not another room. That's a mirror. Um, but we still walk in the wall windows once in a while, right? So it's just interesting for me, I think, to study how we see the world by trying to get the robot to see the thing, same thing. So, um, the first limitation um, of rob robotics is input, and I break that down into technology and cost. Um, this right here is the laser scanner, LiDAR they call it, uh, that sits on top of the Google uh, self-driving car. Um, so the self-driving car actually is more aware of its environment than you and I are, you and I am most of the time. We use our you know vague uh, depth perception system that's kind of crude. Um, and the brake lights, right? The brake lights come on, you stop. Uh, the Google car doesn't look at that. Uh, the Google car is analyzing um, um, everything around it. This says here, I can just read it on here. But um, the Google car knows the distance of the car in front of it down to the millimeter and by proxy the exact speed of that car at every microsecond. So the Google self-driving car knows exactly the speed of the car in front of it. When it slows down, it can slow down. Um, Consequently, it drives much more smoothly than we do, you know, in a following situation because it's so much so aware of its environment. Um, but that LiDAR is $75,000 if you want to pick it up. And um, even the uh, more generic ones you pick up are about $5,000. So, so money is a lot of it. You know, someday this stuff will be cheap. You know, someday this will get, you know, as technology comes down in price, we'll be seeing more of that. But, you know, the reason, one reason your car doesn't have one of these on it to help you drive is another 75 grand on the cost of your car is, is, is kind of, steep. Um, this is, um, so when I was looking for ways to build a robot, um, I found a place called Willow Garage. Um, they made this robot called the PR2. I'm going to try to play this video here and then I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, this is just sort of an example um, of what someone did with the robot that Willow Garage came up with. Um, and I'll talk about it here. Um, in 2006, Scott Hansen, an early Google employee who helped develop Google's technology, started a research lab and a, te a technology incubator devoted to developing hardware and open source software for personal robotic applications. The goal was to create the tools necessary for people to advance the field of robotics without continually reinventing the wheel by building new hardware platforms and writing code to re-implement the same functions on every new platform. So basically what Will Garage said was people keep building robots, but we already know how to do that and they keep having to build new code for the same one. So they wanted to build a platform for research and development, um, which is what that uh, PR2 is there in the video, and build a software system that you could just the open source, you could stick on it and start working with, but also that could, um, that could use other robots too. So that's just an example. You can see you can drive around. You can. This was a project that some a university did. Um, has a huge number of um, features built right in there. So that's what Willow Garage started doing. Um, this is the PR2. Um, they call it the PR2. The thing with the PR2, uh, PR2 can navigate an office environment with amazing agility. Um, it can play pool. It costs two hundred eighty thousand dollars, which not bad for university. You know, instead of having to build their own robot, they can buy this thing right off the shelf, load off systems on it, and start you know teaching their um, students. Um, PR2 has two quad-core i7 Xeon processors on board, 24 gigs of RAM, two terabytes of disk space, and at least two uh, 
$5,000 um, laser scanners on it. So it's an expensive, complicated piece of equipment. And the software built for it was built for a serious um, computer. So the next question Willow Garage had was, would it be possible to do something where the average person could get in on this instead of having to you know, go be a university student um, or come up with a um, quarter million dollars? Um, and here I just talk about you know, what it can do. So they came up with a Microsoft Connect and a vacuum cleaner. And here's another little video just to kind of show what it can do. They call it the TurtleBot. That's an older version of it, but it literally is one of those Roomba vacuum cleaners with a um, Microsoft Connect stuck on top of it. And uh, you stick a laptop on it. And um, look at the price here. Right now, you can buy it, um, including the laptop and the Connect sensor, everything you see there. Uh, you can buy that for two thousand dollars, which isn't isn't cheap, but compared to two hundred eighty thousand dollars, and it's running the same software. Uh, obviously, not as um, you know efficient, but it's running the exact same software as the PR2. Um, so that's what Lagrange did. They made the PR2. They made this. You can run the same software on both um, devices, and you can also get cheaper if you just buy pieces and source your own parts, especially now that we have the maker place here. Kind of wondered, like, there's a lot of parts in there you can build yourself. Um, so you buy just the vacuum part, and then you can start putting some pieces together because it's pretty open. So this is just a quick example of what a, a Microsoft Connect sensor sees. Here's a picture of my uh, living room. And then next to it, it's hard to see on here, but there's sort of the banding. The color banding shows you the depth. So. Um, a Connect camera, it's a 3D camera. It actually uses infrared, to, it paints the room with infrared, and then it looks at that and uses stereo vision. Um, what they do is they just take that image and they just slice a line through it. They just pick out a line, and then they just feed that to the laser scanner input, the same input that the PR2 would be sending out of its laser scanner. They just send the data from this Connect, just one 2D line. Um, but it, it's really efficient. It's high resolution because of the camera's resolution. Um, it's fixed, you know, to your direction. You have to move around, but uh, it's um, it does the job for a small robot. So, um, why use the PR2 software? It's called ROS, Robot Operating System. Um, SLAM, simultaneous location and mapping. Because if your robot does not know where it is and how to get there, it's lost. A um, couple of word definitions here: odometry. Uh, that's is the data from motion sensors to estimate change of position over time. So typically, you get that off of your wheels. Your wheels will have some sort of encoder on them that basically says how far your wheels move. So um, your robot needs to be feeding Ross odometry, saying my wheel has moved you know, one millimeter, two millimeters live. Um, and the other word we've talked about is LIDAR. It's a term used a lot. Um, a LIDAR is a detection system that works on the principle of radar, but uses light from a laser. So um, really, they're sending out a laser beam um, and reading the response. but uh, And I'll go through here. When I first started building, I was going to bring it in here, I left it. Uh, I started building a Lego robot and got some some distance sensors using ultrasonic, um, got a camera on it, got it, I could remote control it, and I wanted to be able to send it from one room to the other. And I started playing with that, and I figured out that it is really, really hard. Um, that's when I started digging up, and everybody kept saying, oh, you want to do SLAM. You want to do simultaneous location um, and mapping, localization and mapping. And I'm like, what is that? So that is the ability for your robot to build a map in real time and then locate himself within that map. And then later to locate himself at any other position in the map by navigating there, so path planning. Um, most of the SLAM information on the internet is papers from doctoral thesis from college students who have figured out how to do it. Um, they sometimes will implement it in, in a simulation, uh, not so often in the real world. I, I think a lot of commercial um, companies have done it, but it's not so common for open source. ROS has two SLAM implementations built right into it. It's available. They're open source. You can use either one of them. There's one called Hector that just uses the, the LiDAR data, and then there's one called G-Mapping that uses that and the odometry, so it's a little more accurate because it uses the wheel input, but it, it combines the two to figure out, uh, to deal with errors. Um, 
something I didn't write in here, but one issue with odometry is in theory, you could put your robot here and tell it, well, the other room is 50 feet over there and then make a right and go 30 feet. That will um, invariably not work long term. Every time you move, every time you turn, you start to uh, build up errors. And eventually the errors overwhelm the system's ability to locate itself. And um, there's a lot of people out there trying to do it, but typically if you don't use some sort of input, visual input of the area, you just, you lose your location and you lose it quickly, really quickly. So um, pretty much the, the laser scanner is the way to go. Um, a couple other things that don't work besides trying to just do dead reckoning off of um, off your odometry, uh, using a compass in a building. Uh, my Lego robot has a really nice compass, and if you bring your, get a, a digital compass in your in a building, you'll find out um, there's a lot of interference. The magnetic field in a building is an amazing jungle. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there's a new field, and north spins around you. Um, it's crazy. Um, it, it's kind of a very drunken way to try to get a robot to move around. It doesn't work. Um, and the other thing that doesn't work is GPS for anything that's an area of less than the length of your house, really. Um, I was able to locate my robot on one side of the house or the other sometimes. Um, part of it is being indoors, you lose a lot of resolution off your satellites. And part of it is it's just not built to be that accurate. So, you know, you, you know where you're at. but. Um, even your GPS units and your phone and your car, often they're using some sort of uh, acceleration data to kind of help them know when you're moving um, or the direction, you know, use a compass. Um, so like your, your phone has a barometer and even to give it altitude to help with getting a GPS lock. So those don't really work. So back to simultaneous location, localization, localization I'm sorry, and mapping. Here's a picture, a little hard to see up there on the screen, but you've got a map. Um, this is an overlay of several different functions all being shown here. Um, but the bottom line is the robot is able to be aware of all of the obstacles surrounding it and then make a decision based on those obstacles. So, Ross, the primary goal of robot operating system is to support code reuse in robotics, research and development. Ross is a distributed framework of processes, they're called nodes, that enable executables to be individually designed and loosely coupled at runtime. These processes can be grouped into packages and stacks, which can be easily shared and distributed. ROS also supports a federated system of code repositories that enable collaboration to be distributed as well. The design from the file system level to the community level enables independent decisions about development um, that can be brought together. So the bottom line is ROS is not a program, it's a pile of packages. When you install it, it puts like over 100 you know, Debian packages on your Unix box. Um, and you get to write your own, in fact, Pretty much for doing anything, you're going to write your own ROS package, and they just talk to each other. It's very loosely coupled. Um, it causes difficulty um, for them to keep it installing, and that's why it, it does install just on Ubuntu. Um, but it works really well, especially considering all the different pieces that are there. And like I said, there's a whole list of robots you can run it on. Pretty much anything out there right now, someone's trying to make ROS work on it, from commercial robots to um, just little home robots. Um, so a node is what they call an individual process in ROS. Uh, so you'll have a node for your laser rangefinder, you'll have a node for your odometry, you'll have a node for just anything that you can think of that you would write a piece of code for, you make it a node. Um, the benefit of the node structure is they can be distributed too. So you can run a node on one computer and another computer on the same network and run other nodes. So as soon as you start it up, you have a network distributed system um, right now I can come over here, and the reason I can see the data from my robot on this computer is because it's broadcasting um, across the network any information that I want. Um, master is just whoever the uh, whoever starts at first is the master. Um, there's a parameter server it gives you the ability to dump any data you want to into the server that um, that will store it for you. So I can go into it's kind of hard to see the the little screens here. I'll stay away from that, but. Um, Basically, if I want to save a parameter like ignore certain sensors, I can put that into the parameter server and then it's available across the system. Um, messages. Messages are a way of communicating between the nodes. Um, every um, node you can set up a structure. Um, basically, a message is just a data structure comprised of typed fields. That's it. So you make a file, you have the fields and their types, and then you can easily send the messages back and forth and because they're pre predefined, um, you know exactly what to send and without getting an error, and you can look it up. Um, topics, this is the part you spend the most of the time on in ROS once you've got your node started. Um, messages are routed via transport system with publish, subscribe, semantics. So basically, um, all any node who wants to can publish any data they want to, and anybody else who wants to subscribe to that topic can subscribe to it. 
So I will try to get on here and list all my topics. If I can spell the word list. Yeah, what do you just zoom on Ubuntu here? Do you know what the zoom is on a terminal? Uh, control, scroll up. Control shift plus probably do it. Yeah. That'd be great if I could zoom. Oh, there we go. Awesome. All right. Big stuff. Lots of topics. Echo topic. Here's my odometry. Um, so this is the live odometry coming from the. Um, did I do that to get that? From the base link, from from the system itself. But basically, every piece that runs has a. Um, as a um, topic, one of the things interesting for interesting for me to run is um, the serial port. This will just show me all the data coming in from my microcontroller to the uh, ROS. So it doesn't look like much here, but every one of the letters there, um, those are my ping sensors. So that sees 106 um, centimeter, 105 centimeter, 103. Actually, it's probably yeah. So. So you can just look at that data very easily, pull it into any other program, and of course, all the pieces of ROS know how to to, um, to digest that data and, and to look for it. So the topics is useful, and again, it's distributed over the network, so you can run the different pieces on the different computers. Um, a service is like a topic, only instead of broadcasting data, it listens for you to tell it to do something. So if you have a node that you want to do something, like say you want it to talk, or you want to stop the robot, or you want it to tell it to go, or explore, or tell it to do something, you start a service, and then you can just send commands to the service from another node. Um, and then it has this concept called bags. That's just a way you can record any data from any topic, and you can play it back. And people use that. Um, so you can record all the data from your topics. You can play it back into a simulation and, and recreate um, a scenario in the computer. Um, so with that brief overview, i am talk about my robot here. Um, so why didn't I buy a TurtleBot? They're under $2,000, got your own computer. Um, I felt the TurtleBot's payload and ground clearance would just really limit what I could do. Um, it just it would lose interest pretty quickly once you've delivered coffee. And they're actually using the TurtleBots to deliver coffee in restaurants in Japan. Just, I guess it's cool enough that people are drawn in by the idea that you can get your coffee delivered by a robot. So um, you can dig it up on YouTube, TurtleBot coffee, and um, yeah, they. The waitress, you know, the lady at the counter puts the coffee in the robot and drives to the table, and the white guy picks it up. You know? But it, it, it's pretty advanced. You think about it, though, the robot's got to get to the table by itself, and it, it does do it. Um, um, and I want to play with it myself. So I built the Arlo bot. Um, the main issue was to keep it circular, like the turtle bot, and to make a differential drive. That's how it works. You just have two drive wheels forward, back, like a tank, basically. And as long as I kept it that way, I actually just run the turtle bot code on my robot. I don't have to modify it. To do that, um, so what do you need to do to build your own robot? Um, first, you need a platform. You need some hardware. Um, certainly, you can use you know one of the small um, you know Arduino's um, are common. Uh, the small like Sumo bots you can buy, things like that. Um, if you want on ROS though, you you really need to have a computer. Um, this it's built to run on that PR2, which had dual. Um, Server processors, yeah, it had a couple servers basically in it. So, and you say, well, could you dumb that down? Maybe, but SLAM is computationally um, heavy, so uh, it needs to do a lot of math. It, it's just it's busy. Uh, once you start it on my robot, it, the CPU spikes and it stays there until I shut it off. So, you really need a lot of CPU power, and to do that on like a Raspberry Pi, it's just not enough power there. Um, they do a little bit on Android, but again, I think they're dumbing it down. So a larger platform, you can put a robot, put a computer on helps. I found this platform from Parallax called the Arlo Robotic Platform. That's why I call mine the Arlobot. Um, it's just a ready-made set of parts that all go together to build 
a robot platform. They give you the, the pieces, the, the built pieces. They give you the motors that will strap onto there. They give you the motor controllers. Um, they give you the casters for the front and back. Um, here's all the pieces here. There's even a power supply, a power, not really a supply, but a distributor basically. Um, and it's all pre-set up where you put uh, two small 12 volt batteries in the bottom of it. And um, it's very, um, you gotta put it together yourself, but compared to fabricating your own system, it, it's a lot easier. And, um, and to put all this together, you're gonna spend over a thousand dollars. But So it's not cheaper than the TurtleBot, but you, you have a platform. Um, I believe the payload, uh, if you get the, uh, and there's two options, you can get the, the steel and the plastic wheels. The steel wheels, the payload is about 60 pounds. And, um, and they tried that. They actually put steel plates on the robot and drove it around the parking lot. So it's, it's got a serious payload. Um, I actually, my robot one day decided to have fun and he mistook the open basement door for a hallway and drove right down the uh, basement stairs at our house. And um, it only broke one of the casters. I was shocked. It, 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 it survived um, some of the sensors and stuff, but it survived that. So I'm here to say it's really durable. Um, <laughs> But, but don't let your Dalek go down the stairs. It doesn't. Did you consider the possibility that maybe it didn't want to survive? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. There was, some, there was definitely some concern for a while there. But, you know, it, it was still alive. I mean, even the laptop survived. So, what can you, you know, it wasn't. But, um, so what are the other parts you need? You need a platform. You need a microcontroller. You need something to connect the motors um, and the sensors to the computer because your computer is going to have serial input or USB input. You're not going to have all that option. Um, so typically you use a microcontroller. Uh, Arduino is a good option and there's actually a lot of, uh, there's some ROS um, nodes out there specifically for talking to Arduino and there's several people out there who've built robots for ROS by themselves using Arduino to control the motors and then aggregate the sensor data and give it to ROS. Um, I'm using a Parallax, the same company, a propeller board. Um, the reason I went with that is just because I bought their, their um, platform, so I used their controller and it gave me, um, I felt good about having support from them. And it was, um, so I did have to write my own node to deal with that data. And it's just C code. Um, the main difference between the Arduino and the propeller board is the Arduino is interrupt based. The propeller board has these eight cores. They're really excited about that. Basically it runs eight simultaneous um, threads at the same time. Um, whether it's actually better or not, I don't know. It's just a different way you deal with it. Instead of having interrupts, you have you get to have eight things running all the time, and they can and then you have a um, you have a common stack where you can put your variables and they can talk to each other. So um, again, and you can probably interface all of the same components with an Arduino. Like I said, I just I was starting fresh, so I went with um, Parallax's own system. Um, but those that's what you, you'll need a microcontroller. Um, need motors? Your motors are going to have to somehow mount to your platform, uh, they need to have encoders. So it's not built into most motors that they know how fast they're spinning. You give them you give them a uh, amount of power and hopefully they go a certain speed, but you should have an encoder on it. Typically that takes the form of a, um, a disc, a perforated disc and a light sensor that's looking through the perforations and just seeing how many ticks go by and counting those ticks. Um, again, the platform from that I got, those are, already there, not like built into the motors that they give them to you and they, they hook right on. So that was all built in there for me. That's what went with that. But there are a lot of, again, you can go online, there's several companies that sell motors and they sell encoders to go with them. You have to have, it. That's and that's where you get your odometry and you really need that um, and have to mount. Sensors, um, while Ross uses the Microsoft Connect sensor to do 3D mapping, there's a few issues with that. First of all, it's just, a, just a plane, just imagine a 2D plane shooting out in the world, that's all it is. It doesn't go up or down, so that's all it sees. So it's very quickly gonna run into things that are above or below that plane. Uh, the Kinect sensor all has, also has an issue um, because of the stereo system, it, it's blind um, to anything closer than about 40 centimeters. So you need to have some other sensors just to avoid running into things. Um, I, what works best is uh, ultrasonic sensors. Uh, there's many different kinds. Uh, I use the Ping. Uh, you can look up Ping. It's kind of a brand. Uh, again, they're sold by Parallax. Others sell them too. Uh, they give you a nice digital readout. Um, infrared sensors, uh, those are good too. The issues I have is typically they give you an analog reading, so you have to kind of deal with an analog voltage and convert that to a, um, to a distance. Um, they're very susceptible to power line noise, so you've got to make sure that your electricity going to them is clean. Usually that means capacitors and such. They're also susceptible to lighting interference. Um, 
I had an issue where my robot was acting strangely and I sent the data output to a person at Parallax and he wrote back and said, you have a, uh, you have a fluorescent light in your room, turn that off. And sure enough, you could just see in the sensor data that it was creating what he called a beat frequency. So every so many lines, you would see this reading. And that was, and the thing is, it's different everywhere. It's different for this light, it's different for LED lights. Um, so it's, some places it's fine, some places it ends up halting your robot because it's getting these weird. Um, so I often just turn off my infrared sensors. Uh, I have them, but I don't always use them. Um, and, um, and they can be blinded by sunlight too. So the ultrasonic sensors. Um, are the easiest to deal with. Oh, and of course, your mirrors and your glass. Um, infrared sensors don't help you there, but the ultrasonic does. So Ross will try to drive him right through a mirror. We'll try to drive him right through a glass window, but the ultrasonic sensors will stop it, and it won't it won't go. So, um, um, and then you need a computing platform. Again, I talked earlier, Android and Pi, uh, if you're going to run Ross, it's just not enough. Um, typically, um, I think I found that laptop for under $300 on eBay. So. You just have to be big enough. Um, wiring. Robots have a lot of wire. Um, I have the least documentation on this. Um, basically, you'll need breadboards, resistors, capacitors. And um, I tell people, look at SparkFun. They have good explanations. Um, Seth Etter actually did a presentation a while back on uh, hacking the world, real world with Node. And he talked about the Arduino. And honestly, what he presented there is about as much as you need to know because um, then you you just have to make them give you the data and then uh, you can, uh, pipe that into into Ross. Um, like for instance, the ping sensor. Here's the website. There's the ping sensor. Here they show you exactly what the ping sensor does. They show you how it works. They show you how to wire it. They show you how to wire it onto uh, this specific board. But there's others for other boards. And they show you the code um, that stamp. There's also code in C. Um, so it's really well spelled out how to do the wiring. Um, and you just take that wiring, and then I lost my. <laughs> yes, washing dishes, right? I don't know what the next. That's our map. So you just take that wiring, and you just kind of blow it up a little bit. So all you see here is the same wiring from that picture, only um, in mass. So here we have the same diodes, the same resistors that were on the picture there. Here we have the same wires going to the ping sensors and just using the breadboard basically to, to take a whole bunch of those and then run um, all the wires together into one board. So it, it's, it's really just a matter of scaling up um, what you've learned. And it's, it's not that complicated. And, and then in theory, some days could be um, soldered together, or something, but, but the breadboards will do what you need for the most part. You know? I can show you more of the wiring later if you're interested. Back to the presentation here. So yes, wiring. Where's my key? Here we go. And Ubuntu. Ross runs on Ubuntu. Um, that's the target that Ross is built for. A lot of people wonder why it doesn't work on other versions of Linux. It really just has to do with that large number of packages and the dependencies, the drivers. Um, even from version to version, there's a lot of struggling with, you know, just like the, the driver for the Connect sensor is, you know, it was it was owned by a couple different companies that sold to each other, went in and out of open source. It's difficult to keep that available. Um, just that's so typically they just say you use Ubuntu. Um, it just has to run on your robot, although you want to run it on your at least a workstation to um, run some of your um, viewing apps. But um, Coding in ROS. ROS is written in Python and C++. Uh, most of the stuff's written in C++, but anything you want to do, you can do in Python. Um, they chose Python because it's easy to learn. Python was created to be easy to learn. Um, typically, if you can understand an if-then statement, you can start to learn Python. There's a lot of tutorials. Um, you really don't have to ever mess with C++ if you don't want to. Um, I have been able, without knowing really under knowing C++, to get in and edit any code I needed to. Um, but Really, you can do everything in Python. Also, since it all runs on Linux, you can use anything you want. I actually am running um, my interface system for my robot on node.js uh, using JavaScript. And I just have it using command lines in the background to talk to Ross. So there's that. There is a um, JavaScript front end, a JavaScript interface for Ross. It doesn't work in node right now. It works on web. So like this page here, it's hard to see. 
you know, there's probably some zooming option, right? So when you tell me how to zoom Chrome. So focus it a little bit. So you can see here, it's telling me, um, uh, it's telling me my speed, uh, laptop battery, um, right motor relay is on, right motor has power, left motor relay on. Um, this is all data coming over um, from Ross via JavaScript um, to this web page. And you could run this web page and you can pull up this website on any computer in the room here and it would show all this information. So there is a JavaScript interface for Ross. It just doesn't work in Node right now. But um, they're working on it. It works in Node 10.34, but not Node 12 or 11. So um, they've got some dependency issues with the Canvas thing or something. Um, my progress so far, my initial goal was to run the map creation and map navigation functions of the Ross TurtleBot package on a robot. That's done. I can make maps. Um, currently, I'm mostly working on making a GUI for it, uh, for startup exploration, map loading, map saving. And then what I'm working on right now is creating tags in the map or waypoints so I can drive the robot to a point and then tag that spot and then tag several spots with names and then next time load it up and have it tell it to go to those locations um, in the map because um, you can see here, once you have a map, I can just give it a goal and it will attempt to go, it will attempt to navigate to that location. And you could also name, you could also save those locations because they're just numbers off the map. So as long as you reload the same map, um, you can do that. So eventually I'll have my house mapped and I want to have um, a GUI like this, you know, or something similar where I can actually go and drop down and say, go to the kitchen, go to the uh, living room. And then interface that with more things like text messaging, there's Twilio. So right now when he starts up, he sends me text messages. I want to be able to respond and say, go to the kitchen. And then eventually the alarm system can tell him front door alarm and the robot can go to the front door, right? And start greeting people with nonsense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, so my goal here is artistic. I really enjoy um, just having fun and playing. So I, when I first started, got it started in building him, I just gave him some random phrases to just say periodically. And he would just sit in my living room and he would just say these random phrases. And it was amazingly, it like people were just, people would be creeped out because they're like, how did he know what I was talking about? I'm like, no, it's just random. No, really, it's just randomly repeating phrases that I stuck into it, but things like that, because it, as soon as something talks to you or starts driving around, you input your own you know, motions to it. You look at it. Um, something a few, when I had this demonstrated here before, he was driving around and kept running into chairs. I said, well, how do you get him to keep stop running into chairs? Simple, you get some people around. The people were moving the chairs out of the way of the robot. It's like, there you go. That, that, that's socializing. The robot has already gotten into human society. <laughs> he just drives around like an idiot and people move the chairs around. But, yeah, but, but to me that's fun because that is an interaction between the robots and the real world. You know, we think the robot has to be perfect, but really he just has to figure out how to interact in our world, not just physically, but actually socially. What can he do to get himself to, into your attention? So I've um, got a lot of um, demonstration things here, that I've demonstrated most of this. Um, this is kind of the cool, amazing thing. So a few minutes ago, um, when we first started, I had him drive around and make this map, and, and he just made this map. Um, we will turn off some. So that's the map, which you see right there. Um, that map will um, be saved to a file if I want to, and can be called back later. So if it's the same place, I want to come back to. Obviously, this map, this room is bound. This pretend room is bound by people up here. But um, um, so you can reload that. It really is just a graphics file, so you can edit it, but you don't really need to. Um, then when it loads the map, it can show you what this global map, this is computationally what the robot has decided, okay, those are the areas I can drive in. So it's exploded the walls and the areas and saying, you know, look, be careful, don't get too close to those. Um, and then on top of that, we have the local map, which is actually it's obstacles. So as it gets close to something and everything's close here, but you can see this, the square box there is his local map of obstacles. Um, the local map will change constantly. The global map is, stays the same, but the local map is actually gonna demonstrate the obstacles. So, if we come over here and stand in front of it, as you can see there, I've actually entered into his um, local map. So he actually shows me his obstacle in front of him. And if I move away, those you know, local map things go away. And that's what allows him to get around obstacles. So if you ask him to go to location and something gets in his way, he'll continue to remap around him. So you just give it a goal and um, 
think he'll show. I think you're going to do that anyway. Find the path. We'll show you his path on here too. Back over here. Okay, and there's the green line. That's a pretty simple path, you know. But um. Anyway, we could stick something in front of it. I don't have anything handy here in the trash can. Okay. So we're just going to stick the trash can here. There you go. It's firmly planted in his, uh, his local maps there. So now if we give him a goal, hopefully he won't try to drive right through. Um, the way the goal works is you put the location, and the arrow is just which way he should face when he's done. So I'll have it face back this way. <laughs> and there's now the path shows going around the obstacle because it's there. Um, and he'll repath, you know, he'll re, he'll, that, and that's, that's what Ross gives you is that ability to localize himself. And, and he'll deal with that, you know, if you move around in front of him, he'll keep working his way to get around you. Um, eventually he'll give up, I think. Sometimes it's annoying, he won't. <laughs> okay, just stop it, never mind. Um, my next goals, like I said before, I want him to have presets in the house. I want to continuously operate, um, adding other inputs like alarm systems, random actions based on pre-programmed behaviors. Um, I'd like to teach, have a way he can follow me. Um, there's a few options with that. Um, right now, um, one of the things built into Ross is color tracking, so you can get like a colored ball and he'll follow it. Um, there are some people tracking options, but he tends to get confused in complicated environments. I find that he likes uh, the corners of walls a lot better than me. So he'll follow me around the house until there's a corner and then he's just happy with that. Uh, <laughs> but um, the color tracking works really well. I found if you're, you want to crack something that is matte, not too shiny, because if it's shiny, you lose the color. And uh, uh, pink works great. Yellow is actually a really common color, believe it or not, in the world, but a pink is not so common. So um, I've stolen my daughter's pink hat a few times. And so I don't know what to use. I'd rather use something less obvious than carrying a pink tennis ball around with me, but if that may be how I start. But I'd like to have a way to follow me. So when I came in here, someone says, why isn't he navigate driving on his own? I'm like, well, because he has no way of following me. Um, and then just generic human interaction based on sensor input. There also is face tracking. It's obviously an option in, in Linux and computers, period. So um, that's something to, to play with, um, face detection, face tracking. Um, eventually, um, maybe give him arms. Um, uh, I'd also like to uh, research uh, 2D um, surface mapping. So like rooms, it's really exciting, but you think about it, it's really, it's actually easy because you have all these walls, but like a car is driving on a road and there's just the road. It's, it's figuring, it's looking at the road and knowing that's the road. That's something I haven't researched much, but I'd like to find out if there's anything built into, um, you know, into Ross or something I'm fine for like driving down a sidewalk. You know, how could it stay on the sidewalk based on the difference in what the sidewalk looks like? And um, if you want to do something with Ross, I really recommend this book, the Getting Started with Ross. Um, this guy he built it's called he have a look at his site it's called Pi Robot. He built a robot some years ago, and um, he updates this book every time Ross updates, which they have a pretty frequent update um, cycle, and it's pretty impressive because he's doing a lot of things with Ross that can be hard to do, and can even be hard to do with the latest version. He makes it all work. Everything in his book works. Um, he does it on his bot. Um, you can do most of it also in a simulation. He explains that to you. There's really good tutorials online for Ross. He guides you those at the beginning, but once you've done those, you'll want more, and this book really helps. You can get it online as a PDF for like $15. It's not that expensive, but it's, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. And um, everything you've seen here, all of the code running on the robot is on my GitHub repo. Um, it gets updated almost every day. I have a blog where I um, journal what I've done and try to document most of it. And um, of course, Robot Operating System, you can go to their website and um, see what they're up to. And that's all. Uh, we could do questions. Does anybody have any questions? And I'll be around afterwards, too. We can check it out. Yes. Uh, so I noticed that you referred to him as he. Yes, his name is Two Flower. and. I'm not sure why is he. Um, I think just because it seemed more. Um, I hated to call him she. I just because I didn't know why she be she either. <laughs> <laughs> it's really neuter, but it just doesn't sound right in there. 
it's just a thing. But yes. What type of hardware um, do you need for the, for, for the processor on the laptop that you're running? On the laptop, um, I'm going to go look at my blog. Would it perform, would it perform uh, better if you had like an i7 or? The more the better. I mean, really, the more the better. It, it really helps um, because Ross, uh, like you said, the PR2 has the server. Um, what you find is you can turn down the resolution that it's using for the scanning. So you turn it down and turn it down and turn it down. And eventually you lose. It doesn't work as well, but you can turn it down a lot. Um, once you get going with it, you want to do more stuff. You know, um, One thing I'll tell you for sure, um, this Arviz program that's visualizing, that's running on this computer. And all that data is going over the network. Um, sometimes this, this shuts down my Wi-Fi so much data. If I run this program on the robot itself, it crashes. It can't do both on this laptop. So if I had a more powerful laptop, you could even run the mapping software on the computer itself. So. Um, Can you transfer over Bluetooth versus uh, Wi-Fi? Well, I think the main thing is just be careful how much stuff you run. Like every time I turn off one of these checkboxes, there's less data going over the network. Um, and just you know, don't run Netflix at the same time. Mm. Or get your own Wi-Fi network for your robot. I don't know. Or maybe I just have a bad network. It's, it's working fine here. I nobody's complaining. You know. Is the mapping software requesting the data, or is it just? Yeah, it subscribes to it, and then it is actually broadcast sent to it. So it's, um, it, it seems to work fine here. So maybe I have a home Wi-Fi issue, but there's definitely less of it. I was gonna say on my blog here, um, I do mention this processor level. Uh, buy lots of stuff and find the laptop here. Okay, so this laptop I'm using is an i5, 2520, 2.5 megahertz CPU. Um, the TurtleBot comes with an Atom N525 dual core processor, 1.8 gigahertz. I consider that's like the bottom. Like, don't go below that, but that's an Atom, so you can run it on Atom. I, um, the other thing with laptops is noticing that they're not necessarily getting faster nowadays. They're doing other things. So sometimes you can get an older one with just as much, uh, you know, gigahertz. Um, and also realize that um, there's the turbo level. Like this one, I think has like a 2.5. Maybe that's a turbo boost. But they never run that when they're not plugged in. They always throttle their CPU when you unplug them. That's all laptops do that. So you're not really going to get all of that power. But um, but yeah. Um, that's what runs the motors, the sensors, the uh, the propeller, the microcontroller. The laptop's running off its own battery. Um, if you plug the laptop into the 12 volt battery, it dies pretty quick. <laughs> I don't think you can charge it. That's actually my limit on runtime. I've never run the 12 volt batteries out before, but the laptop dies in an hour or two. Um, but they're old batteries too, so I could update those. What does um, the mapping and actual limitation of whether you're into something? Is it that laptop? No, it's on board. I'm just so visualizing it here. Right. Correct, correct. I can. This is just getting information and the ability to give it a, a navigation goal um, graphically. But certainly, I could I could send it a navigation goal through another system and you know, make up a website or anything. But the robot is 100% autonomous. It doesn't need the other computer. You could, though, theoretically run. You, the only reason you can't run the mapping over here and the sensor over there is that sending the if the sensor data over the network, uh, there's some lag. And the mapping uh, system is not built to deal with that. It assumes it's real time when the sensor data comes in. So if it's lagging, it's, gonna sh it's not going to work. Does Jim? Uh, on here, on, on the robot, this uh, Ross make extra use of video card processing for the users of No, it's just the CPU. And so no, no, no added benefit to getting something of a dedicated card? No, no, I don't think it uses the video at all. I know the, the Arviz can use your video card. Um, it's just OpenGL, though, is all it is. Like, if you run Arviz inside a virtualization, you'll have to go to a software emulated 3D, but even then it works. Yeah. Uh, Probably someone could write it, but yeah, it's all the stuff is written for. Did you have a question? I think that answer. I was kind of just thinking the same thing. Why are you just sending all the data to the big old four quarters sitting in the corner? Right, right. Um, I, I don't. You could read up on it, but I think you've got to have at least some of it happening on the computer. Um, every year they get cheaper. Like I said, that's a two point five gigahertz uh, dual core 
to look. I think it has threading though. I did find the threads helped. Um, it helps a lot if you can find like borrow a laptop. That's actually how I kind of decided what to do is I got my work laptop and put another hard drive in it and tested it and I'm like, okay, that's what I need. And then I looked, this is a few years ago and I looked at my, I just went on eBay and found a laptop that had the same CPU as my work laptop. Does that work? Because I tried my wife's laptop and I tried an old laptop that we had sitting in the closet and neither of those could handle it. They just, they did, they worked. They just, it wasn't fun. It was annoying. You know, they were, they were just, you could tell. Um, You'll see the mapping just tend to slow down. Eventually, it'll drop internally. It'll start dropping data, and you'll see the mapping just isn't happening. Um, so, but that was like with a uh, dual core one point two gigahertz. It just wasn't enough. Well, I, I uh, like you, you, you expressed why you chose a platform you did and the flexibility you wanted and where you wanted to go with it. Did you along the way? Did you either find some or have to you anything like a, a lower barrier of entry? Maybe you really just want to play with sensors or zoom a lot or anything, anything in between those two where I could. Maybe well, I mean, that's the beginning. That's yeah. Um, what I found was that if I wanted to run ROS with the mapping, I needed a PC. I mean, that's that's what there is. You needed a sensor. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. And that's that's kind of why I got there. I have, I have a picture somewhere. But um, so this little guy, I mean, he's I got he's in the car, but that little guy, you know, he's a, that's a sumo bot if you've seen him, you know, that's the one parallax cells. Um, I had a connect sensor strapped to the top of that, and then I had a USB cable coming off the connect sensor and also a USB cable coming off of that for my serial data, you know, about five feet to my laptop. And I and I drove around the house and, and, and I did ROS with just that for a couple months. That was my proof of concept because I didn't want to buy all this equipment if I couldn't actually do it. So I originally wrote the code to work just with the little robot. So he's only about this big and he would fall over with the connect sensor sometimes because it's too big and heavy. But And I just followed it around with, with my laptop with the USB cable. So I mean, you can get into it and try it, you know, and you can certainly spin up ROS, you know, on your computer. And you can buy the book and do everything in simulation too. So, you know, maybe you're, that's enough. You're done. How much was this project? Uh, the little sumo bot? Um, yeah, so the little sumo bots, I think it's about a, 150, I have to look online, what is Parallax? Um, so I should just look it up, but activity bot, it's called activity bot. Get an activity bot, activity robot kit, um, and that comes everything. So 200 bucks for the activity bot, um, and then the Connect, Microsoft Connect sensors, um, you find them on eBay. Um, the connect sensor gets its 12, its power, 12 volt power through its USB connection. So if you have an old Xbox, Jim has an old one, it like, I don't know, you have, you have a power supply for it, right? Oh. There's like a power supply for the connect. Yeah, you know, we, we, we did, yeah, right, the, the, the new hardware revision of the 360, you just use that plug, and then yeah, if you have one of the original Xbox 360s, yeah, I have one. Adapter. So anyway, you get a connect sensor, you can get them on eBay, and you have to buy a splitter plug. And that's the thing I didn't mention too, I follow the robot, but the connect sensor had to be plugged into the wall to get my 12 volts. If you could figure out 12 volt, you could. So I had an extension cord too, because um, <laughs> this is using an Asus Xtion sensor, X-T-I-O-N sensor. Um, they're like about 200 bucks though, but they just plug in the USB, they don't need the extra power. But, um, the connect sensors you can get on eBay or you can find your own, and then you need a $7 powered adapter off of Amazon.com to make them work. How and much is the connect? I'd say spend about $30, $35, I think, on eBay. Uh, if you look on Amazon, they just vary. There's a Microsoft Windows version for like $100. Don't buy that. There's no point. They just, I don't know why they do that. I think it's a licensing thing. But anyway, I think you can get a connect for like $35. Yeah, I just used the connect off of my kid's Xbox, and then I bought the $7 power adapter off Amazon.com and uh, did that. I did eventually get the Asus. Um, that I don't know if I, I could have just used the connect because there's 12 volts on board. So uh, just a point and then a question. Um, if you're interested in a low-cost 
small footprint robotics platform. We actually, at Make ICT, we have a custom kit that was designed by Yvonne over here and Tom Wire, who's our maker space director. Um, it's basically the same thing, same hardware. Um, if it's Arduino, it's the Parallax, and total cost of the kit, including two days worth of workshops to build and program it, is like 80 bucks. Wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, so, thank you guys and keep. There you go. So start there, because you're gonna have to you're gonna have to know what you learned there to do this. I mean, you gotta know, you gotta understand the little bot, you know, the sensors. Yeah, and it's it's all of the hardware plus two days worth of learning. So, um, question though. So looking at your bot, there are ultrasonic sensors all around that thing. Yes. I'm just wondering if you have surpassed the threshold for the law of diminishing returns to follow those. Oh, totally. It's an experiment in action at all times. It's, it's always an experiment. I'm always figuring out what works next. Um, so the sensors around the bottom were sort of what was originally envisioned by Parallax when they built this platform, and there's little spots for all of them. You notice in front, they're all dual. There's an IR sensor and a ping sensor, and the IR sensors, in my opinion, are mostly pointless because they're between the, there's so many points of interference that they just aren't that useful. So the pings are just go with the pings. Two, why do you need five in front? I don't know. What's that? What is the range? Um, what is the range? I don't remember. I have to look them up. But, um, the ping sensors are pretty far. It's like two across the room. Yeah. Yeah. The way I've set this robot up is it has the microcontroller, which is which is this activity board, um, is list, is reading the ping sensors. If the robot gets too close to something, the microcontroller stops it. Even if Ross tells it to go anyway, it stops it. So it kind of has this, I call it like a cerebellum, kind of like, I compare it to like, if your hand touches a hot item, your hand will actually react to that heat and pull away before your brain knows about it. And that's how the robot is. It will not run into something even if Ross tells it to. And that's helpful for programming. So I can do stupid things on the computer, but the microcontroller is stopping it. Um, so the ping sensors are having doing two different things. They're telling the robot what to do in the microcontroller. It also slows down. It has a maximum speed limit, and the speed limit decreases as the ping sensors get closer to something. And Ross is just limited to that. Um, one benefit of Ross is it's a feedback system. So Ross says, "Okay, I want you to go forward at you know so many meters per second. But then the microcontroller tells Ross, "Okay, I'm going forward, but I'm only going at this speed." Um, or even tells it, I'm going in a circle. And, and Ross is like, okay, he's going in a circle. And it will just report that back and then deal with that information. So it makes it easy to do things like that. So I set the speed limit in the microcontroller and Ross just deals with it. Um, so definitely there's more than I need. Um, right now I'm experimenting with up and down sensors because he has a bad habit of running under tables or not really under them, he crashes into them. Um, so that's why I've got three up there um, vertically stacked and I'm experimenting with how to make that work. So, so follow-up question to that. Um, how difficult would it be to add something like a simple bump sensor to Ross? There are bump sensors on the turtle bot, so you could use the code that's built in there. Um, I don't really know how it works. I haven't designed. I'm mechanically inept in that way. I can, I'm not mechanically inept in like putting things together that are there, but if it's designing something, I just I haven't come up with a bumper. Oh, yeah. uh, Wire. That's what everybody says, but they break. <laughs> <laughs> they break. You know, they, the thing is, once you bump it, then it's dead. So does the, uh, have also? it does. It does. Um, I've since I drove mine down the stairs. I have installed cliff sensors. I haven't really tested them though. Um, the problem is, you've got to know about that cliff pretty fast. Like one nice thing is, like you test it, and it's like it comes with a cliff. Oh, I'm going to stop and roll down the stairs. So um, <laughs> the vacuum cleaner is is so small and low and slow that you know that works. It actually has a wheel in front of the, the vacuum cleaner has a wheel in front, and when it drops down, it shuts off and goes back. So I was using infrared sensors, um, kind of putting it at an angle. Um, what I actually did was I hooked up a alarm system on my basement door. So when you open the basement door, it sends it uses it sends it it writes a file to the robot, the robot shuts off. <laughs> so the door itself, if you, when I started up, there's a big pink button that said, is the basement door shut? And I have to click that button before the robot will even <laughs> so. so you run all of the things? No. Um, well, tables have been a problem. Um, at home, it works good, but then you get somewhere else and find out all their tables are different heights. And so you have like, yeah. Spartan, pardon? Do you have a bed? 
No, no, I don't know what pets would do. I think cats would be um, hopefully run away from it. And um, I don't have a dog. We have kids. The main thing is that. <laughs> yes. Well, you've seen the the cat riding right. groomer, right? Yeah. So that actually would be cool. I haven't tried that yet. If anyone wants to volunteer a cat, we'll duct tape him to the top of it. And make a video. All right. We'll duct tape all three of the top. We'll make a video. Um, it's close. To, I was trying to think about that the other day. It's a year ago in July or late June when I got the parts to build it. It was a year ago, January, when I was building the prototype. So it's about a year and a half now. Um, before that, I had a Lego robot um, that kind of led me towards doing it this way. So you don't know of any uh, open source uh, laser scanner projects that are cheaper than 5000 So yeah, what I do, we use laser scanners a lot. And they're about $2,500. Okay. They're, they're not open source. but. Um, 2500 is cheaper too. Yeah. Okay. There's a little, you can, the bottom line, like the Hoku laser scanner is about 1000, I think, for the bottom end one, which would work great. Um, there is a vacuum cleaner out there called the Neato that uses this sort of spinning, rotating laser scanner. Um, I have one in there. So there are, and there's another company that's like repackaged that, and it's about, I want to say, two or three or four hundred dollars. My experience is it didn't work. It won't make a map with that scanner. So I think they're using what they call Hector mapping, where they don't use the odometry. But I just had bad luck. It, it does drive around with that, so it's useful. So I'm using it for my navigation, and I'm hoping I can offload. If I offload the navigation to that sensor, then the connect can be used for space recognition, people, things like that. So, But um, I, there's a lot of, everybody wants a cheap laser scanner. But maybe if you buy lots of them then they'll come down in price you know? yeah <laughs> you're in heart. i still not know them yeah six months or so ago a lighter local lighter on six cars okay always they speak so i never get it but um it, it and i was trying to find it and i, I just found it for 99 dollars so uh i it actually seen from the reviews that they knew what they were doing I just, you know, until I see one actually deliver a few years, um, I'll trust it. But you know, if it comes out for like a dollar for me. This is the cop sort of, it seems like a copy. I don't know. It's like so identical to the vacuum cleaner scan that, that people rip out. It's like 400. But somebody out there has started, you can buy this vacuum for like $250 and rip the scanner out of it. But somebody started selling them for like 65 bucks. So I, I bought one of those. I don't know where he, I guess he's getting them off eBay or somehow getting them out of the trash and he interfaces them. But but my experience is this won't make a map properly. Um, that's my experience. They show them doing it on the website. I think they're using, you know, they're fiddling with it. I mean, I'm not saying it's not a great deal, but I don't think it's worth $400. Just doesn't seem like it's quite up to that level. Um, are you aware of anybody that's using just video for mapping? Things like stereo vision or motion parallax? Um, no. I could look it up. It didn't seem, no. Yeah, or I mean, technically the Connect is video. I mean, it's 3D. Yeah, it's using the depth. It's depth sensing. So yeah, it's using depth. Um, yeah, the depth information is important. I guess you could get if you could get a video and get I mean, the, the depth image off of the, let's see if we can just get the laser scan here. It's kind of fun here, so you can just start pulling things off. So there's your laser scan. It, it, it's pretty, um, for the robot model back on there so you can see it. It's, um, it's pretty high resolution. Really, you know, when you take a photograph, you've realized that you just don't have that much. I mean, you can see what you're looking at now is people's knees and stuff, but um, you know, it's got a, I mean, there's the can, yeah, there's the trash can. You know, you can see those dots there. It's all made up of dots there. Those are a lot of dots in that trash can. <laughs> it's pretty high resolution. So, um, I think that's part of the issue, and that's what they want with the laser scanners. That's so the the connects turned out to have a high resolution, even though it's limited. And it's going a circle. Although some of the laser scanners are too. So. so does Ross take all that information from all the sensors and 
spits out its best, gets us to flare, to move around, it's a bad layer. Yeah, it only makes the map with the laser scanner, but you can add anything else you want to the planner. So that's um, the ultrasonics are off. So. Um, I know you can for planning. I'm not sure about how, making the map. I know you can for planning. I mean, technically, that's what I, technically that's all it uses right now is laser scanners. So I actually have a, in the node um, in one of the nodes, it takes the data from the ultrasonic sensors and turns into a fake laser scan. And that's how it gets. Uh, so I actually have that because one of the issues is, say, it runs into glass, you know, stops. Um, if Ross doesn't know why it stopped, it doesn't know what to do about it. So you need to send that ping data back to Ross and say there is an obstacle here, even though you don't see it on your laser scanner. There's something here, so go around it. Um, so that's when I ended up integrating the ping sensor data into Ross. Because before that, I was just letting it stop, but then Ross doesn't know what to do. So, um, and I actually have. Um, not on here. I have the other laser scanner too, the one on the vacuum cleaner. But it just makes a map with the one and uses both for planning. Okay, last one for me. How difficult was it to program the three laws? <laughs> <laughs> I think that the uh, three laws are bound up in the, the power switch on the back and they just turn them off. <laughs> and, yeah, that was. Well, let's wrap it up, and then you guys can ask me questions afterwards too. But, um, Thank you. Probably.